The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Um, the Monday Non-Central Series, also, I'm very happy to have our team here tonight. Um, can even take part because we've got some extra funding from the Dean of the School of Architecture and Planning in order to get our visual arts program up and going. So I'm very thankful for that and um, I'm very pleased that you're all here to listen tonight with Tristan Bozicu, who is senior faculty in the visual arts program, but he is as well since many years the director of the Center for Advanced Visual Studies, which is right opposite. Research, dedicated um, to research, and has affiliates who deal with all different kinds of practices, artistic practices, within the environment of MIT. And so, Tristan is here in his uh, double function, but um, but we also realized is that many of our faculty are known by their teaching capacity, but not I need the microphone. I can't get those people. Come on, hear me. Oh. Can you hear me? Is it uh, audible when I speak without microphone? No? Yes? You have to speak very loud because it's a big crowd and this yeah. room is very bad okay. with acoustics. <clears throat> I will try, and uh, thank you for coming. It's, um, it's for me, it's a great occasion to <coughs> capitalize on some of my ideas and projects and say all of those things that I am preventing myself from saying during my um, teaching sessions. Uh, uh, res uh, reserving this for more of a public uh, speech. So, <clears throat> please uh, excuse me if, uh, if I uh, introduce some uh, elements of my general thinking before I start presenting my work. Democracy and uh, the democratic life of public space cannot be sustained if we do not provide the cultural conditions for the inclusion of voice and presence of those who are economically, culturally, and socially marginalized and impoverished. Or some other way alienated or estranged or treated as if they were strangers. When made public, their personal witness and public testimony their critical vision can wake up, astonish, enerve, provoke, and inspire us. The public speech acts can motivate both the speakers, performers, and their interlocutors towards social action. By transmitting their lived through experience openly in the open and doing so in aesthetically articulate and engaging way, the marginalized people can at the same time disrupt misconceptions, media misrepresentations of the real conditions of their lives. Doing so, they can become 
new democratic agent. Through cultural and artistic projects, their voice and presence can effectively and affectively contribute to continuing intellectual, political, and cultural critique, the critical work against perpetuation of poverty, abuse, neglect, and injustice. I strongly believe that the key task of critical art and design in public space is to engage in creative and collaborative projects developed with and by those new democratic agents. Rather than speaking for them, we, the artists, theorists, designers, curators, educators, and others can help those less fortunate and less understood citizens and residents to develop their own capacity to open up, speak openly for themselves, out in the open, be heard and be visible, to be artists in their own rights. They deserve the most inspiring and open conditions for the free articulation, transmission, and reception of their voice. We can be of enormous help in creating such conditions. In case of testimonial and participatory type of public art, as in my own present work, the projects can become a psychological, aesthetic, and political passage that assists the potential democratic agents to move from their initial private confession through public testimony towards a transformative action in real life. The project uh, that uh, you can see behind, it's an old project, and uh, it was designed with the homeless, it was not satisfying. But I, I did learn a lot from what I found was missing in this project. The project was overloaded, of course, with uh, various functions um, in order to transport the evidence and articulation of conditions of survival of those people through various social strata and create converging points of debate, discussion, multiplicity of inquiries about those conditions through its articulation and through the performance of the user, of the operator who became a kind of agent uh, explaining, responding to various questions and bringing the history of becoming the homeless as the history of the city, unwritten history. Yes, this is true, but there was something that inspired me by the fact that this vehicle was not communicated enough. It was used as communication vehicle, of course, but it didn't have communicative capacity. So that's why I developed a series of other projects in which were companions to strangers and the estranged as their doubles, as those through, uh, through which uh, the operators, performers, artists of speech act could, uh, uh, could speak, but also uh, could con the object that could contain their testimonies. So be both containers and openers. Those projects could properly, I think, called instruments or instrumentation. will be uh, accompanying uh, a next portion of my speech. So I will let them speak a little bit so I won't be alone. They will be uh, witnessing what I am saying and uh, also providing some illustration of, my, of what I'm saying. So you see those uh, walking sticks that have containers for precious relics of immigrants, and also very simple uh, communicative devices on their heads, so to speak, the monitors 
and uh, speakers, all of which helps to s initiate the debate, the dialogue around this object that becomes like a sacred point, the point of creating a sacred place in the city, in the place of unleashing passion and various points of view, and also uh, creating conditions for the operator to learn over time how to record and insert the testimony so the, the instrument can speak for her or him. At the same time, it helps others, ourselves, for example, to come closer out of curiosity and somehow creating this transitory object between the alienated parties in the city and transitional objects, speaking like Winnicott, for those who are to learn how to develop their capacities to communicate between their inner world and outside world. Oh, this brings the issue of uh, fearless speech. So this uh, Greek concept, the, the aspect, important aspect of Athenian and later Greco-Roman democracy, Paresia, Foucault brought this concept to us, open speaking, free speaking, the Athenian right and duty, and later even art of free speaking, outspokenness, the very core of democratic process, life of public space, the open speech, required special political and ethical qualifications in Athens. The potential fearless speaker needed first to perfect him or uh, only himself, because women didn't have the right to speak. So himself, uh, he, his task was to be articulate, publicly open, able to speak out honestly from the depth of his own experience while offering an unsolicited and brave public criticism aimed towards the change for the better. That was the requirement of fearless speaker. Of course, what kind of democracy it was, very small and very limited number of members of polis, the polities, women, slaves, mostly didn't have rights, maybe there are some, uh, degree, some strangers, but not much. Therefore, the situation is almost uncomparable. The idea is very important. The core of democracy is there. First Amendment, for example. But in our democracy, we're supposed to be inclusive to all of those uh, people, including the strangers. To some degree, even illegal aliens have a right to rights, as Hannah Arendt would say. It's possible to, ex to, to, to bring them closer to access to rights with some work that needs to be done. So if that's the case, then uh, uh, the, the idea of democracy here and art and uh, expressive aspects of uh, animating democratic discourse require enormous uh, uh, complex understanding and know-how, and perhaps education. Uh, of course, he brought this as a metaphor during the time of renewed discussion on democracy, which was called the radical democracy uh, uh, in, in the 70s. Of, he, however, didn't include very important things. Capacity and ability of interlocutor to listen was not uh, presented by Foucault, probably was not discussed in Athens. It's not enough for the speaker to open up. It's also important to, for the listener to come closer. In fact, the speech act is not so much based on content, but on emotional charge with which one is speaking and emotional charge of the listener. So let's call speech act. Therefore, fearless listening is something I would also advise. My own work still has long ways to go to respond to this requirement. Maybe I should be focusing on this <laughs> more uh, soon. 
So art and design projects in public space must focus on creating intermediate, transitory, and transitional artifices, situations, and events that inspire, encourage, and assist in the development of speaking and fearless listening. So the task of those projects is to create helpful, inspiring things in between, in between the alienated, separate urban inhabitants, things in ev events through which the, the silent, unheard residents who be fearlessly opening up share unsolicited truth, unsolicited truth about their existence, where others will be able to bring themselves fearlessly closer. So. Of course, this uh, is easy to say. <laughs> Due to the growing economical and social divide, inflamed by the recent effects of me and measures of the Patriot Act, the rights guaranteed by the US Constitution, including the right of free public expression, are nearly inaccessible to the impoverished and socially alienated sections of the American people, especially large number of immigrants. For a multitude of reasons, vast number of them cannot actively and creatively participate in democratic process. So in this situation, to call itself public, public art must develop very special strategies and practices to effectively and affectively contribute to the inclusiveness of democratic process in public space. But this is nothing really new here. I'm, uh, it's safe for me to say because I'm speaking to well-informed uh, members of our uh, art uh, community and also educational community, learning community. The artistic avant-garde has advocated at least one important trend in artistic avant-garde, advocated this approach. About 100, or some would even say 150 years ago, artists have been mastering an ethical and aesthetic responsiveness and sensibility towards often hidden and repressed existential and social realities. I believe that still today, albeit in new and different strategies and methods, our response ability, our ability to aesthetically respond to present day realities, neglected and kept in dark as well, remains the core of our responsibility, artistic and civic. It is not enough, however, to take responsibility only for our own response or lack of response to what we see here or rather should see and hear. Our responsibility must reach much further. In our present day democratic artistic project, we must be responsible for responsibility of others, for ameliorating the ability of less privileged, less prosperous people to critically respond to the unacceptable conditions in which they live. This ethical asymmetry in which the others, the less privileged and less fortunate must take the priority is indispensable for keeping our political symmetry in which we are all equal, alike. This is what Emmanuel Levinas is saying, was saying. So as visual artists and designers, practical experts in making ideas, things, and experiences effectively appearing in public and visibly visible and be effectively useful when it comes to design, we must take responsibility for doing something about the lack of ability and capacity on the part of those others to appear and be visible. So public space is uh, a project. It's not something like democracy that it's there. It's something to come, avenir or devenir, something that will be never in our reach. It's like a phantom. Closer we get, it further, but we cannot stop. This is a process. This is not something that is, and I am, of course, well experienced in my 
illusions or delusions and disillusionment about democracy. Because I came from the country in which there was no democracy under the previous regime, Poland. So I came to here in search for democracy. Where is it? Well, I realized quickly that I have to make one. And that's the idea. It's not going to be given to me. When it's given to me, it will be like my previous regime. You know, it's very nice and elegant. Everything is given. In prison, in fact, it's pretty good because you get food on time and uh, heat is, I mean, I'm exaggerating, but some people prefer prison. Uh, at least they think they prefer prison. There's always a prison within the prison. That's, of course, the problem. But I'm generalizing here. It's true that it's a work. It's work for us and artists and designers as well. So when we say this is public space of the city, we also mean monumental space. One reserved for the memory and history of what Benjamin called victors. The space that remembers and celebrates those who have succeeded while conveniently forgetting those who have not. The nameless and the vanquished. The forgotten witnesses, survivors of yesterday and today. So art in public space must challenge the concept and the image of the city as a monument to the victors, might bring democratic inclusive life to the monumentally exclusive and petrified official public space. It's called, celebrated for its heritage and patrimony. Well, the way in which the past is honored as heritage is more disastrous than its simple disappearance said Benjamin. To, res to rescue the past and to save the past from, uh, from oblivion, to rescue it from conformity, which at every moment threatens to harm it, it's, all, it's the task of a historian. But I also think it's a task of a public artist who is uh, uh, focusing on monuments, like myself. That will be another part uh, of my presentation. I will be sharing with you my projections on monuments. Uh, Raymond Ledru, uh, in his essay, Silence and Speech, and the Speech of the City, tells us that the city is not, as we would like, the mouthpiece of the people. Instead, if the city speaks at all, it speaks through its silences. And what it really says can be heard more than what it doesn't say. So. It de demands disruption and uh, with the intervention that inserts a new voice, gesture, and uh, presence. What you see here is Kelly Dobson, uh, a student of Visual Arts program who became a PhD student at the Media Lab and uh, who has been working as a part of interrogative design group uh, where strange instruments like this uh, were created and tested. This one is uh, not for immigrants necessarily, but for those estranged uh, people who, uh, who are in battle in some uh, uh, di internal dialogue between uh, two or more uh, positions or uh, multiplicity of identities in the process of becoming a non-stranger. That's, that's a complicated issue. For example, uh, the person is uh, asking certain questions herself, and there is no agreement about this. And those, this, those disagreements are around certain ideas, concepts, and even words. So this instrument, it's uh, relying on unreliable, in fact, speech recognition software. Uh, but that may be actually interesting as well, because we are all unreliable in our speech recognition and our dialogues with others and ourselves. But to some, de some degree, you can teach 
this speech recognition software, how to recognize your own voice. So what happens is that uh, this instrument is hypersensitive to certain words or questions or sentences and is triggered by them, is uh, replaying, recalling some dialogues, disagreements around them. Example, where are you from? innocent question. For strangers, it very often is an insult. Why? <laughs> this is the problem. So you're asking me, where are you, where are you from? Where are you from? One part of me tells me, thank you. You're interested where I'm from. OK, but why should I be from one place? I'm from several places. I am off many places. And in fact, all right, but why are you turning me into work of geography. Why don't you ask me what I do? I'm here to work. I'm working. I'm a work of work. I'm an immigrant. Uh, so why should I ask? Oh, oh, because you're trying to tell me they are very sophisticated, that you can recognize who is from where by a person's accent. Huh? So I'm here to entertain you to reflect, to contain all of your preconceived notions of my identity for your convenience? Well, this instrument can have all of those things recorded, pre-recorded, well formulated, and many ad else other instruments as well, those uh, mouthpiece or porte parole. So as you can see, this equipment, can be an urban equipment for strangers. Perhaps everybody should be wearing it because maybe we are all cyborgs um, between uh, promised land and lost land, new language and mother tongue, between the way we were, the way we're becoming, each time we pass exams, we are more of more strangers to ourselves. We're no longer natural. We don't know. John Jonas would tell us much more about it. He, in fact, developed a wonderful work in those div dividing spaces in between in which we live, various questions and doubts. So, yes, perhaps we are all need to be equipped. Maybe we are already equipped. We have to recognize it more and more. So, we also have the right to refuse, to protest. This speaking of truth. When I say truth, I mean the way Foucault understands it, critical truth, questioning the truth that is being imposed on you. <laughs> this is the truth. So, well, of course, uh, if that's the case, the protest is a little bit of a prophetic thing. So I think that uh, some of those instruments um, have a prophetic character. Protest actually it's a very positive thing. It's pro-testing, meaning witness. So I witness what I experience and I question it in order to propose something better. That's protest. So there's no, it's a kind of utopia which I like. So. I propose that the protest is a kind of utopia that focuses on the place, topos, located in the present day, in the now, not hidden behind the horizon of the future. Utopia, no place, no place. Utopia, or good place, in quotation marks, so good place. So I propose no exclamation mark, place. The place I refuse to accept. I denounce the place as unacceptable to me, to my children, to everybody around, in hope that in the future there will be no place for this place, for all of us. This is utopia of strangers, of people who are estranged. This is, uh, uh, of course, utopia of this instrument, which was also designed here in interrogative design group, 
uh, with the help of Adam Witten, a research specialist who is now a uh, graduate student in Media Lab, and Sang Ho Kim, who is a professor of architecture somewhere, and uh, many other people. Uh, this instrument was designed for uh, Japan, for the city of Hiroshima, specifically for uh, high school students. The high school students who, um, and I will have to uh, change a little bit this, just to show it properly. The high school students, uh, as much as not only in Hiroshima, but in other places in Japan, are in difficult situation because they are bit entering this system in which there is no gray zone, they say. You either are in or out. From a relatively protective environment of elementary school, they move into kind of training camp for competitive and very tough life. Uh, so they don't really even have time to develop psychologically as still children or young people. They are always passing some exams uh, and always memorizing things that are already said. There is no room, they say, for themselves. Some of them refuse the school. They are called school refusers, which is not school dropout. They are, many of them are going to school and refuse the school there. If there's going to be a new cultural, uh, some kind of social revolt, maybe even revolution in Japan, I'm sure it will be done by high school students, not university students, because it's too late for university students. They're already locked into the system. And maybe the leaders of the uprising will be school refusers the ones who are negotiating between domestic war between their parents and families and the war at school where everybody is against everybody on the smallest basis of difference. So it's also true that young people in Japan uh, never really approached with any questions. No one asked them what they think. And uh, so the some equipment is needed for face-to-face -face communication in general, but specifically for those young people. So to make it short, once I went there and started to make sketches, uh, I was asked first to produce the sculpture for the city of Hiroshima, the Public Art Commission, and I refused. I started to, to talk to people, to people not the form of the city, but the people. And that's why I focus on those young people and school psychologists and psychoanalysts who work with them. So we started to, many times, moving there and back and forth between Hiroshima and Boston to, to think of equipment that will allow those people to speak through their backs because uh, they say in, in Japan that it's easier to understand the person, what person is thinking when you look at the person from the back. Um, so why not speaking through the back? And why not having a, a fantastic options, uh, unthinkable options here? Cannot find this. So the options are you can have a speech. Your eyes are transmitted through your back. You see through those, uh, those uh, little monitors. Then uh, voice speaker, microphone speaker. You can then speak directly through your back. You have a rear view mirror or a new version. There is an additional uh, video camera and monitor. So you can see interlocutor perfectly well. And you can refuse to speak. That's for real time speech. 
but it's possible to pre-record all of those things that you want to say far in advance, like where are you from or, or other response to other questions. Uh, questioning the question, which in fact has an ethical dimension. Once you question the question, you really have to propose a larger uh, kind of critical position. So this equipment was used uh, in a kind of preliminary form. This is what you see now, the kind of pre-prototype. And then it was uh, uh, built again and in, in a more kind of precise way. But it's very much a mixture of quite primitive uh, technologies. It's just that uh, they provide an interface between them and the human body and all of those different equipment, it's a big problem. <laughs> so as Benjamin said, uh, the di uh, vibration of a diaphragm provides sometimes better condition for the start of thinking than vibration of the soul. Laughter is good, it interrupts, opens up, and brings people closer. <laughs> of course, not much happening here. Um, just a very little. Good afternoon. What are you doing? Laughter. Good sign. Healthy sign. This is a view from cafeteria, the top of high office building, occupied by large number of uh, men, usually, mostly, of various rank uh, uh, officers, clerks. Um, and um, the woman who decided to wear this, this armor and bravely move into this environment um, told me that those men will look very similar to her father. Her father left the family without a word and uh, a penny, without explanation, disappeared. And it's blamed for everything, of course, by the mother. And there's no uh, any trust left in this young woman's mind towards men like this. But somehow, maybe out of uh, intuitive uh, uh, tendency to heal this kind of symptom, she uh, decided to go there because it was her decision to that place, wearing this equipment. So um, let's see how it works.
So she said it was a good fear because I guess she realized that those men are human, that there's something there. It's not gone. They actually were kind to her. However naive they may have been, but somehow strangely positioned themselves as psychotherapy without <laughs> knowing it. And she opened up like a patient to them. So that brings the uh, one issue I wanted to mm, bring, and then we'll be moving into projections, I promise. Uh, the issue of uh, ability to speak. If we expect those people who are traumatized by the very experiences that they should communicate, we expect them to be major democratic agents like she became, we have to create conditions for development of the capacity to speak and open up. And this process might take a year, year and a half. Okay, if it's a normal psychotherapeutic series of sessions, uh, without uh, 20, 25 sessions, you don't really e expect people to start speaking in a non-traumatic uh, voice meaning you don't expect them to bring emotional charge to every detail, or they, uh, they re re revise memory of, of painful events in, in emotional way. They will give you very dry facts and details, reports, without any passion. So it's worth very little. It's important to create conditions for... Uh, so those people were learning over a year how to record those uh, things to the instruments because they had uh, computers that actually function more like uh, memory containers and players. And those computers inside allow them to record a lot what they would like to say to the world in response to various situations that most likely will happen. Preemptive work. And once they recorded this, they didn't need to use this equipment because somehow it opened up and articulated lots of things they would like to say. So this same uh, is true in when, uh, in, in my work, I try to uh, appropriate and use uh, mon monuments and memorials as vehicles through which people could open up and speak to the city, taking advantage of their prestige and historical importance but also playing with what those monuments are already trying to say, or with the history of meaning projected upon them before, or with circumstances that project themselves upon them at a particular time. So it's a complicated uh, animation process, but it's aesthetic, definitely. It's political, for sure, and it's also psychotherapeutic, no question. Because without, uh, and it's psychotherapeutic not only towards those who animate the monuments. Metaphorically speaking, of course, I have to say that monuments themselves are in serious trouble. Looking at terrible things happening on the steps, overseeing injustice and very often contradiction between their own idealists and what is happening around. They cannot say the word. Imagine yourself being in their position. You see all of this? It turns your stomach and heart inside. You have no capacity to speak, open up, and share it with anybody. Monuments need help. If the city is divided into residents and monuments, there is some strange similarity between them, at least some of them. They seem to be uh, similar in their frozen gestures, incapacity to speak, to open up, and one could say that traumatized city residents are leaving monuments to their trauma. This is a metaphor, in fact, used by Judith Herman, the psychotherapist who's working here in Cambridge in the clinic. So, if that's the case, the issue is clinical, political and clinical. Public space and democracy is a clinical issue. 
So uh, in, in this clinic, in case of projects that I propose, the residents are, have to heal themselves in order to open up and speak through those monuments, or even speak without monuments, being themselves projectors that project their own experience into the city, like with those instruments. So, in order to uh, heal the numbness and incapacitation of public space in monuments, they have to heal themselves. In order to heal themselves, they have to perform and act and become animators of public space because it seems to be easier to open up and tell the truth to masses of people and to unknown people than to closest members of the family, very often. Or even to therapists in the clinical enclosed environment, although I don't question the need for both enclosed therapy and public space as therapeutic work. Although the second idea is not immediately recognized and embraced by psychoanalytic uh, societies and population. Uh, the cult understanding of cultural work, relation between cultural work, political work, and psychotherapeutic work in public space is not clear. Although Judith Herman was quite interested. Because we both were speaking in the conference in the Museum of Fine Arts organized by Boston Psychoanalytic Society and Museum of Fine Arts on Trauma and Art. But um, there's still a long ways to go to really develop trust between those fields. So, to struggle for recovery from trauma is to find a narrative voice through testimony. And this has a greater chance of success when performed as a public speech act. This tells her the words of psychotherapists and psychoanalysts. Even more so when directed at social utterance to and on behalf of others. Act of public truth-telling, and here the psychoanalytical language overlaps with Foucault language, because he's also speaking of paresia truth-telling. Act of public truth-telling has a restorative power. Psychologist Pierre Janet termed this act presentification, presentification. Well, Janet was a competitor, a counterpoint to, to Freud, and was a very important figure in the history of treatment of trauma. So here, he was already advocating this. So here, the political, the, the, uh, the, the psychotherapeutical, the aesthetic, cultural are all into one project that can be understood as one project. Monuments and memorials in their speechlessness and stillness at times look strangely human. Like traumatized humans in their motionlessness and silence might appear strangely monumental. You have to take a note of this. Speechless survivors living in the shallows of those monuments face the blank facades and blind eyes of our public buildings and the memorials, those speechless witnesses to present day injustice. Both monuments and survivors require reanimation. Of course, monument, and here we will move into monuments, uh, are, the word monument actually is not only uh, about commemorating something. It has also something that is memento, which means warning. It's I warn you. What I'm commemorating might happen again, for example. It's a very important concept of commemoration. So in that way, memorial and protest are similar in some ways. Could be similar. Protest is memorial as a, uh, as a uh, warning. So this is a suspect and witness at the same time. El Centro Cultural this uh, otherwise called La Bola in Tijuana. 
Um, it's a gift of uh, federal government to the province of uh, Baja California Norte to teach them or educate them what culture is, but also combine myth of uh, progress and form of neo boule structure and, and Maya goddess, which has nothing to do with that region. I mean, there was no Mayas in that region. But inside there is uh, IMAX theater. It's a projection inside uh, par excellence projection of illusions of, for example, glorious relationship between people of Mexico and people of the United States and things like that. People of the sun, it was called, when I was doing projection. <laughs> now, but, you know, when you see uh, uh, on, along the horizon, well, you don't see what really matters in Tijuana. There, those are places where masses of people live in shacks without water, electricity, and road. And they work in factories called Maquiladora. Maquiladora factory is a border factory that is taking advantage of cheap labor around the border. And it's accepting parts that come from all over the world to assemble them and send them back to original market. It's called Maquiladora. So it draws labor from the most uh, vulnerable section uh, population, in this case, mostly girls, not women, teenage girls who work in those factories. Even on the factories, there, are big, there were big slogans, girls only for employment. Uh, of course, in this El Centro Cultural, which is the pride of Tijuana, city of Tijuana, uh, there is exhibition spaces, educational programs. It's actually quite a complex project uh, to be admired for what it does, but to be questioned for the fact that there is no trace of those women and their lives there. So I went to this place called uh, Factor X, which is an organization of women who try to learn their rights protect themselves against exploitation. Uh, but they, in fact, talk about everything, including domestic violence, incest, uh, rape, uh, also factory situations, terrible cases. But it's all basically self-help post-traumatic stress group. So they um, first, when I approached them, they said, no, uh, thank you. Uh, why should we? Uh, you are one of those. We went through this before. Uh, they're all of those journalists who want to make art and money and fame out of our misery. Why should we trust you? And said, bye-bye. Then I came back with videos of my projection in Kaku mostly devoted to similar, more or less similar cases of exploitation and abuse. Uh, they listened a little bit, then uh, some of them left. Another, many trips between Boston and Tijuana. New York, Boston, Tijuana. So uh, at the end, or gradually, what happened is they, each time I proposed the project, mentally speaking, in terms of their fantasy, they were destroying the project. They were destroying me. My job was to survive, to come back and fight. So once it was clear that I am survivable, and project is survivable, I guess they came to the conclusion that that project can be used. I can be use, useful for them. That's a kind of classic Derek Winnicott model. Uh, so, um, but also, in this process, they learn how to uh, use this project uh, to insert some of their uh, problems, but also accept certain limitations and problems in the world, because the project is a like work of architecture as well, or design. This is always some kind of transitional object, what we do. But in this particular case, this was the object. So this was to be 
the Syrians. They were to become the largest people in the city. Um, in fact, not just the height, the, the face, the entire face, filling this space. And they will be speaking to the city and to the world. Media will come. Media always come to architecture because it's already media. Umberto Eco told us this is the 70s. It's a media architecture. So any time event happens in front of monument, there's always television and radio because the new events always describe themselves in stable symbolic forms, right? And that's how it works. The city works this way. So television, mostly, and radio, press. So they, would, they gradually re realized that some of them will never participate in this because it's too risky. And one of them will say, okay, my husband is coming back from prison in two months, and he's going to kill me because I put him for insult. It will be harder for him to kill me when I am exposed like this because of the journalists, this I will be. And somebody else said, no, I'm not ready because it will destroy fragile process in which I am trying to repair some damage to my family and so forth. So it was a complicated social, psychological process. So one year it took. It was part of a festival inside 2000. A festival is a good thing. It's another topic. And I would like to elaborate on this later. But um, before I show this, I would like to show the equipment that was used. It was designed also here. It was designed, an interrogative design group, very simple. It's basically what it used to be called in the media lab, wearable wearable television station. It was a headpiece with the camera, microphone, and lights. So the position of the face could be perfectly aligned with the geometry of the facade. Face, facade, a similar word, in fact. So uh, as you can see, it was used it was used uh, over a year to record testimonies to, so they will fit this. But I was hoping that when we come closer to actual projection, they will accept the possibility of putting it on in front of the public and blasting some more truth. Because each time the story is told, the story is different. As one rabbinical scholar said, the one who believes the story is a fool. The one who denies the story is a wicked non-believer. So the, the, tru the truth of the story is an emotional charge and also in the process of recovery of what happened. And uh, so it, it was a, maybe the best moment to add something. And fortunately, they agree. They agree. Could we turn off uh, the lights, please? 
There's always a problem with ambient light, those projections. Um, in reality, and also here. So she became completely black, irreversibly. Was treated with aspirin and sent back to work. So she decided to bring all the names of the doctors and all of the managers to this uh, project. But her speech is still very dry. Uh, I think that um, it's just because um, the projects are not for people who are really clinically ill, but for those who already survived, went through various stages of uh, safety, uh, the kind of remembrance and uh, reconnection according to some categories of trauma recovery. So it's a reconnection stage. She is between. Uh, but there is another um, uh, case here of uh, the person who... Sorry for this. Mm. who is um, in much better shape. She's talking about her husband who tried to escape to the United States with his girlfriend through the border and they were caught.
So, to uh, complete my presentation, I would like to present uh, one project. From Warsaw. stop at this point and uh, reserving perhaps some more information uh, in response to some of the questions. This projection was done in Warsaw last year. Uh, since then I also was on a few other projections and I am planning to do more. And as you can see, uh, uh, the health of those people somehow depends on their playfulness, ability to laugh, and to uh, animate with humor the architectural facades. Uh, in, uh, to some degree, their health uh, was much more advanced than the health of the public, which was seriously uh, observing all of this with kind of uh, para-religious focus. So uh, maybe it will help to develop some other projects to challenge the lack of humor and uh, the kind of uh, uh, facade-like behavior of uh, both politicians and the public and also <laughs> the monuments themselves. Thank you very much. Before we go to a question and answers, which I think would be very helpful, I also want to mention uh, for those who are interested in this notion of trauma in the arts, that there also recently has been published a book um, 
it is called Drama in the Arts. Um, we have that also here and it's in the library because also um, Erika Naczynski and Mark Tarkosenbeck from our History, Theory and Criticism program um, have been writing about just as practice within this book. So I also want to mention that Tristan is recently working or currently working on a monument for um, commemorating the abolition of, of slavery of slavery in France for next year. I mean, enslaved in this project in the past six years. <laughs> so Hopefully it will be finished. It's very interesting um, to talk not only about the notion of uh, what could be a monument in these days and also in um, <coughs> in a time that is still related to crisis and disaster, and again, what role does the artist take to maybe unpack this notion of the monument? And also, I think a lot of your work also deals with the notion, how can we recreate a public sphere, a critical space in the public that is more and more privatized? And when I see um, the, this notion of being outspoken on the one side, one could say, these people get really highly exposed, but on the other side, seeing the people, it's also almost like a relief to once make yourself public. And again, there is a lot of writing um, relating also to, um, if you take some psychotherapists, they deal with uh, the, the difficult times of the witness being outspoken. And it's not for everybody. No, and sometimes yeah. it causes also rather mm -hmm. harm to them, yeah, but so obviously, close. You, you work very closely and very carefully with the people over a course of time. So maybe you can say also a little bit like to the reactions, um, like how's the public, for example, reacting to that? Because it's almost sometimes, mm -hmm. I experience people almost get shocked when they are confronted mm -hmm. with an emotional kind of yeah. um, experience. Yes, I'm worried about the public yeah. more than about participants. So maybe you can say a little yes. bit about that. Yeah. Um, well, in Tijuana, it was the most uh, painful blast of truth telling in my projectionist practice. Um, people were wearing headphones because it was simultaneous translation for people who came from the United States. Um, and so suddenly I realized there was something happening, something was happening unplanned. Definitely, because there were lots of disturbance. And I was later told that the translator, interpreter, burst into tears, which is a very professional from Mexico City person who never, who never done so. So, I, I, at this point, I started to think maybe it was too much. One thing that helps is the life of the city. What we see here is framed by film. Even if the camera moves a little bit, it's still, you see, it's, it's not that you feel the entire city living around with all the sounds and movements and people coming and leaving. This um, um, uh, distortions that, that you have to take into account when you walk around, that is real and unreal, uh, that is part of the larger public life of public space and this helps to accept sometimes very difficult thing being said and films are uh, and the film is too harsh but um, it's a it's a problem in Poland I realized it's not that it was too harsh it was a mixture of very humorous statements and very painful uh, testimonies but when there was humorous no one was laughing so I realized something I should have known, that this is my part of the world. Sick, traumatized, for centuries. This, the, the public is repressing so much inside that they could not open up to people who opened themselves up to them. Of course, so the participants were in a better position, even if they went to hell. I don't, it doesn't really answer your question, I guess, but um, and, uh, maybe elaborate it a little bit. <laughs> you know, that it's, it is, I uh, experienced myself that there's a very strong reaction if you are confronted with that, and it's so overwhelming. 
but one other question I want to put, and then I really welcome your question also here, is like um, with the projection, this is understood in, in the world of arts that this is taking place, like the cinematic, the projection is a part of an artistic practice, but you also teach your interrogative design and you have these tools, the vehicles. Very often artists are very resistant to be too closely linked to design because they want to do something autonomous, mm -hmm. to be not involved like in something useful and um, so the notion of design was is always like uh, some artists try to distance themselves from that. But you are even uh, offering courses on the very purpose, and you work with with um, kind of a certain function of your works and of your artwork. Can you say something about that? Yes, I will put something in the background for entertainment. This is your truth. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, design. I think it's uh, because there is some um, possibility of um, bringing art close to everyday life and um, also recognize the, the use value as something that can be connected with symbolic or even artistic. I liked very much design. And I think that in the tradition of the artistic avant garde, there was always a kind of tendency, but not always, a large part of it, like constructivism, futurism, fluxus also, um, and punk, I um, mean, you know, in the 70s. There's a lot of interest in design. So art into life somehow uh, moves through some design project. So why not uh, teaching it? I mean, that makes perfect sense. It's just that um, you need to also learn design methodology. So in fact, design is not only doing things, but also not skipping any stages in the process to really uh, going through analytical or it's a cognitive process through which we are bringing ourselves closer to reality. It's, it cannot be done in a monastic environment of artist studio. It has to have some element of, re of field research and, and also understanding of the relation between what you do and how it will be perceived because it will be also used. That's not a joke. You know, it's not something to the gallery. So it, it brings lots of elements for artists. If that's what I like. Sometimes when I look at the work of art, I am nervous will become part of some kind of decorative design very soon when it's bought by some not a collector. But when I uh, look at the work of design, I see the possibility that it will become art. That's, uh, so, polemically speaking, I'm protecting what's not being uh, taken care of enough. If it was all about design, I would probably do it another way around. <laughs> it's visual arts programs, so I think it's time to bring design. The school is thankfully open enough to, yeah. to accommodate this. And I am in fact industrial designer, just for the record. I've been the head of industrial design uh, uh, kind of uh, department in a big uh, company in Poland, the equivalent of Bausch and Lomb, Polish Optical Works, and designed various instruments, equipment, and so forth for many years. So it's not that I came from, but you know, my professor was in fact a director of graduate center here, years of old time. You know, so, um, and uh, he was the one who was in charge of industrial design program. That's the record of his years you know, kind of, uh, interest tradition. So architecture also was part of my. Uh, upbringing. Yeah, it's all connected to the work. So you're at the right place here. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure like, some of you also have some questions. Sure. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the idea of justice in your work. Because, um, 
just if it functions as a balance, because these projects are all in some ways corrective measures. And I'm just curious what mm. the relationship of justice to speech or communication, how do you see those functions? Well, uh, Jules Herman, whom I know actually, after that conference, told me that she's now working on a book on social justice. So it means that the link between, at least in her case, between psychotherapy and psychoanalysis, social justice is obvious. It's uh, almost overlapping here. So um, in the public space, uh, it's what Foucault called critique. It's basically or uh, what uh, Habermas called public sphere is just uh, calling authorities accountable for uh, wrongdoing, including injustice. So public space, uh, whether it's electronic or physical or mixture of the two, is a fantastic uh, opportunity, of course, to animate it with uh, um, with the grievances and protest and uh, visions, critical visions. So uh, it's, I guess, from uh, ancient time, from Athens, it was about, um, I don't know, maybe it's about um, public justice. But the thing is, it's before things go to courts. So it's a kind of justice which is ethical. Because once things go to court, it's not much ethics left except professional so-called ethics of lawyers. But between or, or instead of courts um, cases, we are judging authorities and each other and reprimanding each other. Jerusalem was destroyed, Talmud says, because citizens stopped reprimanding each other. That's one of the reasons. Or it means there's some need to uh, emphasize the conditions of those who are in, better, in worse shape than you are in public and also to help them to move into stage. So I don't know if this is an answer, but justice is there. In fact, all of the buildings, monuments, civic, they all have, are all about justice. They claim that they are protecting this process, uh, ex cathedra officially. But then in front of them, there are protests against those sculptures of justice. And they uh, call them as witnesses of the injustice. So public space is a theater of justice, discourse and justice, I think. Is there any questions? Yeah. Speaking of uh, the social justice, and the, there's also um, many approaches now, like after uh, the Nuremberg trials, like that there should be something like the pros and reconciliation yes. processes. This is what happened in, in uh, uh, St. Louis, what we see on the screen right now. The projection turned into ad hoc or maybe not at thought, maybe I provoked it, but I didn't know it would happen this way into justice and reconciliation event. Because you see on the screen someone speaking back to the building. There's a microphone, the building is animated by someone inside, the person inside is seeing interlocutors through camera, and seeing own animation through additional monitors, while the person on the street is only seeing the building speaking. So it's all about uh, murders. St. Louis is the most murderous city probably in the world. It's, 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 people prefer to go to Iraq than to live there, most young people. There's much less chance to be killed in Iraq. So there is always somebody who killed somebody, or about to sink out, and then people walking on the street. So the whole event turned into questioning and debating impossibility of living with people who murder your closest without seeking uh, at least have a revengeous tendencies. So here the Christian rules and ethics was being questioned, like this person is definitely in disagreement with the building. And 
I know God tells us we have to forgive, but yeah. we should remember. How can I go about dealing with this person and not let my anger get out of control? think that it, uh, you have to remember two wrongs don't make a right. No, that's nonsense. And uh, uh, to do any retaliation would only bring yourself to this level, and that's not exact, that's not who you are at all. Mm -hmm. But I think to, you know, just continue to uh, ask for help each time you have to deal with them. Because I, I refuse to uh, act like nothing ever happened. I know people who accept that fact and feel that nothing happened and this person did nothing wrong. But I thank you for listening to me and thank you for doing what you do. So. I think it's um, cause specifically like um, in the time like where there is a uh, process is are needed of truth and reconciliation specifically if it's not individual like crimes but it's uh, civic wars or it's times after dictatorship or even in South Africa people went through that after the abolition of apartheid like the, there's a societal process needed that is not like there's an individual that needs to be justified but a whole society has to go in such a process and I understood from people working on that that they look very much into collaborating with people from the cultural sphere in order to develop other processes than the bureaucracy mm -hmm. of justice, which the court very often represents. Like, what is your experience? Like, people approach you in that way? Like, when you did the process in Warsaw, like, you get approached by the city, or mm -hmm. how? Yeah. It's, uh, it's uh, um, uh, the problem here. It's relevant to your question. <laughs> it's... Uh, <laughs> It's a museum, a uh, Kunstmuseum, uh, taken over by sans papier, people without documents. When you look at me, for all of those doctors, they know how to send their dress to my company. So, in this particular case, it was a museum that asked me to do projection. But it was not easy because of city regulations. So, in fact, museums sometimes are ambitious enough to move into production, not only to hanging things that are already produced somewhere else in exhibitions. So I rely on this tendency. But uh, they put themselves immediately into agency uh, between various bureaucracies. Uh, so many different bureaucracies that it puts them into some trouble. But in general, without permissions, you cannot do anything. It's just uh, uh, an illusion to be kind of guerrilla projectionist. You know, you need to have all sorts of permissions, mm. and you have to then ed uh, play politics and educate people not only what you're going to do, but also educate them they don't have to know what you're going to do. They don't have to know everything, what you're going to do. That there is, that there is democracy, you know, <laughs> which of which they keep forgetting. <laughs> so it's, there's always, no, well, in the United States the best, because it's the only constitution in the world that has communicative rights as the first one, First Amendment. French or the seventh position, French constitution. But uh, so I don't know about Swiss, each canton has a different <laughs> rules and regulations in the city. But so the majority of um, basically commissions you receive come directly either from art museums or from culture boards? Or is oh, yeah. commission by a city to work like this, the problematics of like homelessness or? Mm -hmm. Who is the, major the cities usually are not that open because they don't want to be at the center of the debate for which they, in which they are implicated. But um, mm, the best thing uh, is festival. That's the best thing. Because festivals are carrying, the, consciously or not, the tradition of uh, agonistic democracy, agone, Athenian, Dionysian festivals, they were open to 
poetic uh, contests to athletic contests and even citizens from uh, uh, city states at war with Athens receive special immunity papers to come and participate in Dionysian festivals. So that means that contest of critical and oppositions was, was special space. So Inside 2000 was a good example. Here there was a project very difficult and heavy and uh, it could only happen because of festival, because of a certain, uh, yes, immunity <laughs> that was offered to artists. Otherwise, it's tricky. You always have to play various political games. But uh, sometimes you ask for permission, like in London, Trafalgar Square, it took three months to get permission. You have to have permission to photograph with tripod on Trafalgar Square. So and even unpacking equipment is impossible. But once I was there, I decided to do something else. Bureaucracy doesn't work at night. They don't have meetings at night. Well, of course, I projected something completely different. It's supposed to be hands or something. I projected intercontinental ballistic missile wrapped in barbed wires uh, and also swastika on, uh, on the pediment of South African embassy. Um, when it if, all right, well, then, of course, the police called itself that someone is defacing the building. They always call themselves in order to arrest that there was a complaint. I had a lawyer, that's me. Uh, I was told, um, then I took a slide out, because it was a slide. I could stop projector. There was nothing there. Uh, but it was already two hours there. It was soon by tens of thousands of people. Uh, no one noticed, really, because it was there as it natural as it was always there. That's the kind of as if the building was already designed with it. So then they noticed when it was not there. <laughs> what happened? So I was told that if I do it again, I will be arrested. Because uh, if you want to know my private opinion, uh, the officer said, it was in a very bad taste. You know, they've been teaching the world to taste, you know, for centuries. The taste. Like, for example, apartheid. <laughs> but uh, it, I was not arrested, but the, um, I wanted to say something about this. Um, do not get arrested. Do not get yourself, your helpers, your sponsors, your bosses, collaborators, users, interlocutors, anybody else arrested or fired, unless it is part of your project. <laughs> but if it is indeed part of your project, then please get a good lawyer. <laughs> I think that's a good final word. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs>